Hi, you're listening to It Happened to Me, a rare disease and medical challenges podcast. The mission of our podcast is to support you, our listeners, and to create community as you confront the toughest challenges in life. All of us will experience health hardships. The real question is how we adapt. That's the focus of It Happened to Me, which wants to help you overcome limitations and live a full and satisfying life. Drawing on their own health challenges, co-hosts Kathy Gildenhorn and Beth Glassman interview guests who share stories and research to help you succeed in the face of difficult health obstacles. It happened to me. I'm not alone, and neither are you. When Julie's son, Ben, was born with congenital hyperinsulinism, she and her husband were determined to give Ben the best possible life. HI is a condition that causes the overproduction of insulin that leads to severe hypoglycemia. In 2005, Julie joined a dedicated group of parents whose children were also affected by the condition to found Congenital Hyperinsulinism International, CHI. The mission of CHI is to improve the lives of babies born with HI all over the world. We are so impressed with all Chi has accomplished, like organizing over 30 global conferences, creating disease awareness information in 24 languages, and providing patient experience expertise to six biotechs. Chi hosts and moderates a virtual support group with over 2,300 family members of people with HI. Through her volunteer role with the National Organization for Rare Disorders, NORD, Julie is a rare disease advocate for people with any rare disease. Julie was the New Jersey Rare Action Network ambassador for NORD from 2018 to 2022 and became a NORD Policy Committee Task Force Co-Chair for the East Coast in 2022. Julie has recently been named a member of the New Jersey Rare Disease Advisory Council. Julie is a frequent speaker at rare disease meetings and conferences and is the co-author of many scientific posters, three papers on HI. Prior to her work at CHI, Julie specialized in international educational and journalism projects with a focus on Eastern Europe. Julie's academic background is in Russian literature. Julie draws her strength from the vitality, courage, and perseverance of her son, Ben, and all those who live with HI and its consequences. The community of friends and colleagues focused on improving the quality of life for those with this condition inspire Julie every day. Julie, thank you so much for coming on our program. So Julie, let's start at the beginning. Can you tell us about your son, Ben? I would love to. It's it's a pleasure to be on your podcast, to meet you, and of course, to share about Ben. Ben is now almost 28 years old, and he is just a delightful young man. He is full of gratitude and, and happiness and, and, and has such a joie de vivre about him. Um, he, he leads a very full and wonderful life. He lives independently, uh, very close by to us. And he works at a wonderful general store and has volunteer jobs um, at our local synagogue and um, is really, um, really interested in providing food for um organizations that that often provide food to people who have food insecurity. So that's just a little about that. That's what uh, it sounds like he's a wonderful person and you've got to be so proud of him as your son. So Julie, 
Can you tell us a little bit about his diagnostic journey? What led to the diagnosis and what symptoms he had? Yes, absolutely. Um, So one of the things that really distinguishes HI from many other conditions is that it is so imperative to diagnose extremely early in life. And three days into life can even be too late to Mm. Uh, have, wow. Yeah. To to have um, it prevented prevented a brain injury. So in Ben's case, the first two days of his life, when I was still in the hospital with Ben uh, in the birthing hospital, I noticed very strange rhythms about his um, his hunger, his feeding, and then his lethargy. He began life being extremely, extremely hungry and and wanting to feed all the time in a way that was very different from most newborns. And because I was already an experienced mother, um, I had a wonderful two-year-old daughter, Hannah, I was able to compare those experiences. And I was also in a newborn nursery with seven other mothers and their babies. So I couldn't help but kind of compare what was going on with Ben to what was happening with these other pairs, these mothers and their newborns. And so Ben was very, very hungry, wanting to nurse all the time and was upset and crying. And that went on for hours and hours. And then that just flipped, like a a switch just flipped. And he was suddenly extremely lethargic. And is this a typical, is that typical of um, most children that have this condition? It's a great, wonderful, wonderful question. The problem is, is that this is not something that's been researched or studied. Oh. So yes. So um, yeah. it, 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 the, the stories of, of birth and of the first um, few, few days of birth and pregnancy and, and the, uh, those experiences, those are now all being collected in the HI Global Registry by CHI. But prior to that, there really hadn't been any kind of body of literature about the newborn experience of babies with hyperinsulinism from the perspective of parents. So mm-hmm. yeah, uh, so we're, we're sort of just sort of getting to that, like how to tell that story about the whole community of, of babies born with hyperinsulinism. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, but yes, I imagine that if you, if, if you, if that research was very solid and and it was um, and there was a lot of it, we would see that there was there there could be that kind of pattern of in the in the in the first few hours when the baby is is very hypoglycemic that they would be trying so hard as hard as they possibly can to 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 get to bring their glucose up. Wow. And, um, and then they would hit a wall and just be so hypoglycemic that they wouldn't have the energy to drink or to wow. yeah. Now, are there genetic factors and or inheritance patterns that are associated with HI? Yes, yes, um, there certainly are. And the, the, the um, issue there is that there are many different kinds of patterns. There are certain <laughs> known gene mutations in certain genes that are passed um, through autosomal recessive kind of um, inheritance. There are others that are passed through a dominant kind of inheritance. Huh. Yes, depending on, in, in some cases, it's actually in the same gene. So it's, it's a very complicated um, kind of landscape, the genetics of hyperinsulinism. There are, at this point, over 30 different genetic causes of hyperinsulinism. And some are have a monogenic cause and some are not necessarily monogenic. Sometimes they go along with syndromes. And in about 50% of the cases, the, the genetic cause is not even known. So we're only talking about 50% of the cases being able to understand the genetic cause. Wow. Yeah. So if a couple has a child with the condition, are we at a point where we can kind of figure the chances for a full sibling to also have the same condition or a similar, it sounds like a a different version of a variant? Yes, yes. There's a lot 
there's a lot we can help them with. There's a lot genetic counselors can help with them with and uh, through genetic testing. So they, the parents would find out the genetic cause of their child's hyperinsulinism. And um, in 50% of the cases, they would have some sort of positive result. And if they get, if they have a positive result and they find out that it was, the child has a recessive form, then they would know that the child has a one in four, that they would have a one in four chance of having another child with, child. with HI. If it was passed down dominantly, they would find out that they have a 50% chance. Wow. Yeah, but then there's another very unusual form of hyperinsulinism. It's focal hyperinsulinism. And this is when the mother's genes are missing from a certain area of the pancreas. So the father's gene is the one that's determining whether the child has hyperinsulinism in that section of the pancreas. And so that is called loss of maternal heterozygosity. And when that happens, then the chances are like one in a few hundred that the child will have it. Wow. Yes. So yes. with this being a rare disease, and coupled by the fact that it seems like symptoms can be generic, what are the hallmarks, the flags that both parents and caregivers can ever see that might allow them to suspect the diagnosis? Right. So if a child comes home from the hospital and has hyperinsulinism but has not yet been diagnosed, um, unfortunately, what a parent might see is a seizure. So the child's mm. hypoglycemia might be so mm -hmm. low that um, that the hypoglycemia that it could cause a seizure. So that that would be something the parents might see um, mm. that they would absolutely seek seek medical attention for. Um, okay. You know, the, there are signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia that that occur that include um, being lethargic or being jittery. Um, and there's a whole list of different signs or symptoms. Those signs and symptoms can also be many other things. So the signs and symptoms of, of, of hypoglycemia are not really enough to diagnose. To diagnose. You no, know, the baby then would have to have a full workup. Well, what I want to come back to is you mentioned that if it wasn't detected early enough, there could be brain damage. Yes. And is that a common symptom of undiagnosed HI? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, so baby, uh, babies are at risk for a brain injury and having developmental issues and um, other sorts of, of, of cognitive development issues and um, movement, you know, issues with fine motor or gross motor and many other kinds of, um, of disabilities that can be caused by prolonged hypoglycemia. So, you know, hopefully, um, and this occurs quite often, this occurs mm. in, you know, over, over 35% of, of mm. women who have hyperinsulinism do have some sort of um, learning disability or or some kind of neurologic issue as a result of the condition. Julie, after children are born, every state runs children through a, uh, a panel, a screening. And I'm wondering, is, is HI on typically each state's panel screenings after birth? Yeah, so that that again is is a, is a wonderful question, and the newborn screening program, which is a fantastic program, and and it helps so many babies with the conditions that are on the panel. Those yes, uh, hyperinsulinism is not on the panel, and the reason oh. it's not on the panel is because those are based on a dried blood spot and being able to determine what a disease is in a laboratory from a dried blood spot. But there isn't a test that can be run on a dried blood spot that will show hyperinsulinism. Mm. So that is the reason why hyperinsulinism, that is the first, the first obstacle to being on newborn screening. Were there 
were there the technology to be able to detect the disease through a dried blood spot, we would then have the at the big advocacy push to get it on those um, on those different newborn screening panels you yeah. know, around the country. But we don't have that. We don't have that option. But we are trying for something else. So, yeah. yeah. It, it seems that therefore your doctors, your nurses really uh, are your mainline defense. They need to be ever ready, ever vigilant to look at children, to see this uh, feeding, massive feeding and this lethargic um, up and down, as you describe it, uh, right in, in uh, the first two days of life. Well, really quite extraordinary. Yeah, yes, yes. It, it, it is incumbent upon those who are yeah. taking care of these babies medically to be very vigilant about these signs and symptoms. It's a huge task and we really yes. need more than just the vigilance. Yeah. Yeah. So there is. So we a, need a new test. We need a really, new test. Really, we need a new test. You need a new, uh, new test we in order to get test. it on the panel. We need a new test. Now, hypoglycemia is very easy to test for through a reg through a little drop of blood uh -huh. so, so not the dried blood spot but a, a little heel prick and mm -hmm. many babies blood glucose level is in fact tested soon after they're born if they are large for gestational age if they are small for gestational age if the mother had gestational diabetes these provoke a test of blood of blood glucose level. And that would I show see. whether a baby is hypoglycemic. So some babies, in fact, you know, as I shared, many babies with hyperinsulinism do not go on to have a brain injury. And it could be that that's because those babies were tested. Their blood glucose was tested very, very soon after birth and then well-managed from that point mm -hmm. on. Because it's mm -hmm. not enough to just do the one test. The, the testing has to continue because um, another important fact about congenital hyperinsulinism is that, that confuses the whole issue is that many babies are born with hypoglycemia. It's part of just becoming a human, going from your mother's metabolism to being on your own. That little bump, that sort of kickstarts your, right. um, your, 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 you know, your blood glucose um, metabolism occurs after you're born. And so finding these babies is truly like a needle in a haystack. It is very mm -hmm. hard to find them. And that's why we need this extremely um, kind of sophisticated way of, of testing these babies right after, you know, soon after birth within an hour or two of birth, testing their ketones over time, um, over, the, over, over the first couple of days of life is also really, really important. So we have this terrific group of, of brilliant experts from around the world, pediatric endocrinologists and neonatologists who are working on a protocol uh, to study this and to see what is really the very best way to screen universally all babies to see which have this condition and which who do, and how who prevalent is this how widespread is this so um prevalent studies again are are very different Few and far between yeah They're difficult to carry out but um the literature <clears throat> points to about one in 28,000 babies born are born with this condition. Okay. Yeah. So how did HI affect Ben when he was growing up? So Ben, um, you know, we found out Ben had this, con within, Ben came home after two days from the hospital. But by the next day, we sought out medical attention for Ben and Ben had to be hospitalized and Ben was in a NICU and then Ben had I see. surgeries. So Ben was hospitalized for over the first three months of his life. So that was a big oh. kind of difference. Yeah. Um, yes. And um, Ben had to have his pancreas removed and he had to have very 
round the clock. Back. As a newborn, he had his pancreas removed? He did, yes. Oh. It was the only oh. way to get his blood sugars under control. And even so, he still, it was very hard for him to get off of the IV. He was still severely hypoglycemic, even after having his pancreas removed. So when he went home, he still needed treatment and there wasn't really a treatment that would work for Ben. So we, we had to use off-label medications and, huh. and Ben had 24 hour nursing and that went on for many years. Um, and so he need, Ben needed just around the clock care. Now, the other thing that's unusual about hyperinsulinism is he needed this around the clock care but as long as there was this army of people at home keeping his blood sugars in the normal range, he wasn't like a sick child. He was a, a happy, growing, and, de and developing child. Wow. Yeah. Did he go to preschool? Was he able to? Yes. So not only did Ben go to preschool, he went to preschool early because he qualified for the preschool disabled program in our community. And so that starts at two and a half years old. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. What a balance. I mean, yes. the challenges medically with the just, it, it, he sounds like he was just curious and raring to go and yes. ready for stimulation. Yes. So now Ben is a grown man. He's 28. He is. And, and how does this condition affect him today? So one of the things that occurred with having his pancreas removed is over time, he became diabetic. So, mm. yeah, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to believe that after the removal of the pancreas, he still was dealing with hypoglycemia for the first nine years of life, but he was. And then he had a few years when his blood sugar levels were kind of in a normal range without any medication. We still had a you know, had to monitor it very closely. And then at about 12, he developed diabetes. So he has an insulin pump and, a, yeah, and a continuous glucose monitor. And so he manages his diet. That's how he manages his diabetes with these, you know, devices and insulin. And then he also developed epilepsy as a result of not being diagnosed in a timely manner. Um, he, he has medication for that and, um, he'll have an aura before he has a seizure, which is so is he able to identify that aura? Yes. He's aura. able to identify it and get into a safe place and oh, good. he can eat, he'll call us and say, I'm going to have a seizure mom. It's quite amazing. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so for our listening audience, um, if you have, uh, a child or, or a loved one with epilepsy and they develop this aura, you don't want to be, let's say, in the shower or on the bed. You want to get down on the floor so that you don't harm yourself and fall. So that's what we're talking about. The aura would be the signal. And, and uh, I guess the good news here is that Ben is able to recognize when the seizure is coming and so he can put himself in a safe uh, position. Yes. That's so important. Now, does he live independently or he has yes, someone with yes. him? Yes. So so the other good thing about his seizures is they're partial seizures. So he can actually sit down. He can even just sit down. Um, mm, I see. And, um, yes. And he lives independently and he lives in a wonderful uh, building. And the building has some really um, helpful supports for safety and it's close by, so he le leads a very independent life, and he has lots of friends and supporters, and 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 we're close by too. And you said that he also works. He he's, he works. he works and does volunteer work. It yeah. sounds like a very healthy balance. He does, and he's he also um, has low vision from the prolonged type of glycemia as a baby, and he um, had some learning challenges and fine motor challenges. He also has a lot of wonderful strengths. Um, you know, he's, he's very, he's, he's very verbal and he's very, um, he's very logical and he's very good at executive functioning, which is so helpful because sure. it's complicated to 
for him to take care of himself, but he's able to do it. Right. Well, and it sounds like he must have good social skills. He lives in a group housing uh, environment, so he is able to get along with neighbors. Yes. Well, he has his own uh -huh. apartment, which is really wonderful, and uh -huh. in a building. Um, but oh yeah, he's very social. He's kind and loves people. Yes. Wow. So can can we talk about the um the formulation of chai? Uh, how, um, how did this come about, and how old was Ben when this happened? Sure. So when Ben was about. Uh, two and a half years old, uh, I was connecting with two other parents that I had been introduced to through the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where Ben got his uh, very excellent, excellent care. And um, so we decided to start an email listserv so that mm -hmm. we could communicate with each other. There wasn't any kind of lay information about how to raise a child with this condition. and um, there wasn't a community to connect with, to just sort of share thoughts, share difficulties, share triumphs. So we started this listserv and people from all over the world started to join. Oh, and, that's great. And it, 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 it became a real center of activity for the parents. And it mm -hmm. was so helpful and so supportive. I bet. Yes. Yeah. And then we had, we, um, in 2003, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia had a family conference and they asked me to be one of the people helping to plan it. And through that, we just got this big burst of, um, of real kind of seeing the strength of, of patient advocacy and what people could do if they came together for mm -hmm. others living with the condition. And so we very organically founded an organization in 2005 to support families through the difficulties of raising a child with the condition and then adults and, and to raise awareness of the condition to prevent unnecessary brain injuries, preventable brain injuries, and to uh, support research so that there would be treatment so that people wouldn't have to have their pancreas removed or other use off-label medications that may not be completely effective. Or um, yes, and to find there is one medication that works for a subset of people, a pretty big subset of people with hyperinsulism, but to give those people choices and options for other treatments as well that might work better for them. So would you say that Chai really uh, helped families become aware of what was to come? Uh, maybe what to look for um, and knowing that there may be surgeries, there may be hospitalizations, there may be medications, there uh, they may be looking at diabetes, epilepsy. Is that what the foundation sought to do? Absolutely. The, we, 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 we sought to help people better care for them, their children and care for themselves. Mm -hmm too, because this is a condition yeah. where parents often feel this constant worry uh, yeah. that, you know, the, it's on the parents to ensure that their child uh, each and every day does not have prolonged hypoglycemia. So mm -hmm. we want to support the families. We wanted to help the parents understand what, what could be in the future. What is the natural history of this condition and how it will affect their individual child? Um, because this is a condition that really changes over time. And sometimes it changes yeah. for the positive, which is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. There are kids who simply spontaneously outgrow the condition. Oh, and, wow. Yes. So we're often able to give families a lot of hope. I'm sure. Now, is there a web address that um, we can post in the notes to the show that that someone who suspects HI or someone that knows their a child has been diagnosed with it could reach out to you or reach out to the oh, support great. groups. Yes, yes. So it's www.congenitalhi.org. That's our web address. Okay. And um, I know that it happened to me. We'll post that uh, in our show notes. That would be great. So that'll be great. Thank you. 
Now, I'm wondering, how has Chi's HI Global Registry contributed to understanding the natural history of HI, and what insights have been gained from this initiative? Kathy, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, so we consider the HI Global Registry to be a really important patient-powered research project. So the participants, often the parents, will complete 13 different surveys that go over every aspect of, of the child's life with hyperinsulinism. And when you bring together the survey data from each individual and you pool it, you can see all sorts of patterns that have never been mm -hmm. seen before because the, the families have never been surveyed before. We also have adults living with hyperinsulinism who also complete surveys and are participants on, on, on their own. So what are some of the incredible insights that have been, um, that have, have surfaced? First of all, just the amount of hypoglycemia that still occurs in diagnosed patients. Mm. So, you know, we think, okay, you have this condition, you go to a doctor, you get some medicine, but what we're seeing is there are still a lot of, of individuals who are having a significant number of hypoglycemic events. Is there any suspected reason for that? Well, because there just aren't and there aren't treatments yet to um, to really control the. So control. what exists isn't yeah. enough to yes. prevent yes. it. Yes. So, so that's really important information in and of itself because mm -hmm. that can accelerate the. It, it explains how much unmet need there is in our community and why we need new and better treatments. And we've uncovered that. We've uncovered what an issue feeding is with this disease and. And so this, this condition, so many children have trouble feeding as a result of the disease. And, and we've, we've been able to share that in a way that um, is really new. And that's very important too, because that's such a basic of life. And mm -hmm. when, when it's a condition where eating is such a big part of keeping your glycemia your you know your your uh, yeah managed managed it's just so important so so that's been really important and then quality of life there's so much about the quality of life that we've been able to show and share through our registry the amount of worry parents have over hypoglycemia how how their lives are really controlled um by this disease and 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 also areas of of access there are some places in the world where it's very hard to access the one drug, diazoxide, that is on the market and the off-label medications and the devices and the supplies to measure blood glucose. Um, so we're able to col collect all that kind of information as well. And then the side effects from the drugs that the, that the, um, that the individuals with hyperinsulinism are on, and that's really really important, um, how the pancreatectomy is for those who have what's called diffuse hyperinsulinism throughout their pancreas, how a pancreatectomy is not, it hasn't been a therapy that that is truly either um, preventing, stopping hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, or we see that those with uh, who have a subtotal pancreatectomy all go on to have diabetes. So yeah, yeah so we, we've uncovered many, many, many important facts about living with hyperinsulinism that are contributing to drug development. Also, in terms of the universal newborn screening, seeing how many babies were not screened for hyperinsulinism, showing that there is such a big need for universal screening for hyperinsulinism. Absolutely. And can you tell us more about the HI Centers of Excellence designation program and its impact on the care provided to babies and children with HI? Yes. So it's so important when a baby is born with hyperinsulinism to get to a center of excellence. It's the difference between 
being in the being in a place that is in the know and has the has has the most really really good good understanding of how to treat this condition and people with expertise who've studied this condition for years and a multidisciplinary approach. Um, you know, this is a condition that you need you need expert endocrinology care, but you also need expert surgeons potentially if the if the baby is going to have a surgery. As I said, there is this one type that's focal where in fact a baby can be cured if the if the center has an expert surgeon who's performed many, many pancreatectomies on babies with hyperinsulinism, if the hospital has this experimental um, drug that is used with a PET scan, it's called the F-DOPA, that will help to, um, to be able to visualize the pancreas, to be able to see that there is focal hyperinsulinism and where that focal uh, lesion is located in the pancreas. So right. if, a baby, if a baby goes to a center of excellence, and they could potentially be cured of this disease, which will be much more. Wow. Different. Yes. And even with the pancreatectomy, they don't end up with diabetes? If it's if it's focal and they just take out the, the portion of the pancreas that is affected, the baby will not get diabetes. Oh, wow. That's for, huge. Yes. And for a baby like my baby, who had a uh, very severe diffuse hyperinsulinism, and actually wound up having to have three subtotal pancreatectomies. You know, these are mm -hmm. tiny little babies. And, and as I said, Ben now has diabetes, but he's very, you know, he's very strong. His GI system, you know, he, he has some pancreatic insufficiency because the pancreas was removed, but he manages that. And because he had such a great surgeon, Dr. Scott Adzik at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, you know, he manages to have this really wonderful life, even with. That uh, is fantastic. Yeah. Such great news. Yeah. And what role does Chi play in securing funding for research grants and supporting patients with emergency funds and uh, medication donations? And how does it all work? How do you uh, yeah. so, spread it all out? So. We're very grateful that as a result of now numerous publications, as a result of our awareness programs and our, our webpage, many companies that are developing novel treatments, they come to us and they, they ask to partner with us. And so we're able to support their research through our research with the HI Global Registries. We, we help with qualitative research to help them understand other aspects of living with hyperinsulinism. And then we give pilot grants to researchers who are researching potential new treatments, sometimes the preclinical research that needs to get done in order to even get to clinical trials. And that we do mostly by partnering with the University of Pennsyl Pennsylvania's uh, Billion Dollar Bike Ride Program. And so we count on our supporters from, from all over the world to support this research. And um, yeah, so we're, we're hopeful. You know, it's, 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 it's a long haul with a rare disease. There's so much to learn. And there are very few people to be in the clinical trials because these diseases are so rare. But, you know, the community coming together, collaborating makes it so much more likely that these drugs will will be able will be studied and will get to market. Well it sounds like Chai has been instrumental in coordinating researchers with biotech firms. I mean and that's key uh, in order because it sounds like um, this is a a disease that needs treatment. Uh, we need testing, we need treatments and uh, we need to marry these the biotech firms with the researchers and you are filling that very important uh, nexus between them. Uh, that's, that's really wonderful. You really have done a great job in creating this. Bravo to you. I think that's uh, really wonderful that this group has served uh, its patients so well. You're really uh, doing a great job of networking 
Can we talk a little bit about virtual support groups? Yes. Uh, this is something that is um, for Kathy and for me and talking to people with rare diseases, that support groups are so, so important. Important for the patient as the patients get older, important for the parents. Um, and I wonder if you could elaborate a bit. Yes, yes, absolutely. And in in our community, we have a, a very, it's a rare disease, but that original, as I said, we had this email list way back when in the dark ages and, and people communicated that way. And then we went to Facebook and we started a, mm. a, a support group on Facebook, which has been going on for many, many years. And it is so active any day or night, any hour, people are connecting there. They're sharing their concerns. They're getting supported. Information is shared. And it's so it's helpful because the worst thing about this disease is really just feeling alone with it. And mm -hmm. once you find a community of other people <clears throat> dealing with the same things, it just, it just lifts a burden. And, and the other really cool thing is that you know, people start out maybe being very, the neediest one. I've just joined. I don't know what's going on with my baby. I don't know how to help him. I need support. And then over the months, sometimes that parent is already an expert and is sharing and helping a newly diagnosed parent. I was just going to ask you this. So imagine you're a a parent with a child who has just been diagnosed, what advice would you give to them right from the start? Well, um, this might sound counterintuitive, but my very first advice would be as much as you can, as much as you can, enjoy your baby. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, just- That's beautiful enjoy, advice. Enjoy yeah. Enjoy baby and- Focus on all the special times that 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 you are having with your baby. It try if you can to you know just be that competent parent as much as you can. Learn as much as you can about how to take care of your baby. Get the best medical care you can. Go to a center of excellence in the United States. As I said, we have top. We have Cook Children's in the United States. And then in the United Kingdom, we have GOSH and we have the University uh, of Manchester Children's Hospital. And in, in Germany, we have Karate in Berlin and Dusseldorf and we have Magdeburg. Um, go to one of these places if you can or to a doctor who will work with one of those centers. If you're in the hinterland somewhere and not the hinterlands, but in a, a country, you know, that you just can't get to a center, get to a doctor who will work with them. Um, and and join the support group and and let yourself be supported. And uh, very good advice. Yeah, this is all good. so incredibly helpful. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just wondering in what ways can individuals and organizations contribute to the mission of Chi and support families affected by HI? Well, that's such a good question. And uh, they can go to our website. You can go, listeners, to our website. Uh, you can learn about the condition. And, and a donation would be so, so helpful. And um, as I said, we're, we're kind of like the hub. And we work with researchers around the world and, and try and support patients who can't get access to medication and, um, and help them to access that and to raise awareness so that babies don't have to have a brain injury and can grow and develop as normally as 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 they should so it would be wonderful if, if you could well how do you take how does she raise awareness about hi on a global scale especially in regions where access to information and resources might be severely limited yeah what can she do yeah. So first of all, uh, as you mentioned, we have information in 24 different languages and it's all on our website. We have posters and we have infographics 
And so people can share that. Um, they can share it electronically. They can print them out. If they want us to, we'll print them, we'll send them. You can distribute them. They can, uh, one of the wonderful projects that we've worked with the experts on from around the world is care guidelines, international care guidelines that have been agreed upon by uh, the experts all over the world. And those are on our website. They can share those guidelines and those show how to treat a baby medically with hyperinsulinism. Um, we're through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we got a grant to create a wonderful collaborative research network, and that is a research and advocacy group. And so one of our collaborative research network, one of our highest priorities that we agreed upon together was creating a global campaign that we call Glucose is a Vital Sign. So we've got this strong committee that's working on that, and we're designing right now um, a campaign that includes graphics and language. And then we need funding for a PR campaign mm -hmm. to, you know, get that, get that campaign out there, get on podcasts like this. This is a great <laughs> start. Um, and uh, to get paid media and earned media spots, we're going to make it. We do have now some funding from the European Commission through this wonderful project we're working with our European partners on. Um, an, another terrific uh, potential treatment. But we have some funding to make a documentary film. So we'll be working. Oh, that would be great. Soon as well. So, Julie, how do you see the future? The future for treatment? The truth uh, and the future for uh, research. Yeah, so I see the future as hard, but good, <laughs> that will continue to work to support researchers and biotech firms developing new treatments, that there will be new treatments, that will have medications that make it easier to manage hyperinsulinism, so there's less hypoglycemia, so babies don't have to have pancreatectomies and don't have to develop diabetes. And uh, research for these better diagnostics that, that we talked about earlier so that there's universal screening. And one day, uh, maybe there'll be a cure, a, a full cure for this disease. And mm. I think with all the research that we're that the research community is doing with the patient community and all the collaboration that we're going to get there. Here, here for all rare diseases. Yes. Let us find cures across the board. Julie, you are really a wonderful spokesperson for mm -hmm. HI. Uh, I, I can't, we really, really uh, you're so articulate and uh, you make this very manageable. And I can imagine parents listening to this might feel a sense of ease knowing that it is manageable and their child will succeed and grow and flourish. I think you really have given us a roadmap. I wonder before we wrap up, is there anything else you would like to add? Well, I guess. So one thing that I have learned and one way that I have grown through this experience of having a child with hyperinsulinism and being part of this large community of people living with hyperinsulinism is that we have a lot of neurologic differences in our community. And, 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 and I've just come to see that, that every, it's just, it's just quite amazing that the, the community really comes together and we see the strengths of each individual in our community. And, and that's been just a real education for me to understand, to accept, to, and to cherish and love each individual with hyperinsulinism. All our children are special and beautiful, aren't they? And they, we love them all. They are. Thank you so much, Julie, for being a guest today. You've really um, made this uh, a very interesting program and educated us about a very rare disease. And certainly now we are fully acquainted with it. And thank you. And we want to wish Ben all the best of luck. Thank you so much, Julie.
you say. Absolutely, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. And you're doing a wonderful job about raising awareness and making people feel like you're not alone. And that's really what what this is all about and trying to form a sense of community um, right. for all experiencing the medical challenges of any sort, let alone rare diseases. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And she's lucky to have you. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with both of you. And I, I thank you so much for having a podcast like this. Thank you for listening to this episode of It Happened to Me. We encourage you to learn more at ithappentomepod.com. Please use the contact form on our website to submit your guest suggestions, comments, questions, ideas, and feedback for the show. You can also email us directly at ithappentomepod at gmail.com. We would really appreciate it if you can leave us a five-star rating and review on your podcast app like Apple or Spotify. This helps others in the rare disease and medical challenge community find us. It Happened to Me is created and hosted by Kathy Gillenhorn and Beth Glassman. I'm Kira Deneen from DNA Today, and I serve as our executive producer and marketing lead. Amanda Andrioli is our associate producer. Ashlyn Anokian is our graphic designer. And remember, it happened to me. I'm not alone, and neither are you.